Uh, I'm looking around and seeing that there's nobody here, which means people have gotten the message. And uh, so we are, uh, we're, we're streaming this morning. Uh, we're uh, due to an uptick in uh, COVID-19 cases in our county and also among our congregation, we decided that it would be best prudent to, um, to not gather in person for 10 days. We made that decision this past Wednesday on the 6th. And so uh, that takes us through next Saturday, the 16th of not gathering in person. And so there's no small group gatherings in person. There's no church count or uh, finance committee or deacon or uh, Sunday school or any of those things that have been taking place. We're, we're not doing any of those things. And so uh, our plan, our plan is to reconvene back together as a church body here at New Life Baptist Church next Sunday, January 17th. But of course, plans change and and it all kind of depends on how things go in the next few days. So uh, I just want to thank you so much for tuning in and joining us this morning, wherever you are uh, on your couch, whether you're wearing slippers or a suit uh, or sweatpants, uh, whatever you've got on is a great time to join and worship God. And so uh, just there's not a whole lot of announcements because, to be quite honest, there's not a whole lot going on. So uh, this morning, if you would uh, just bow your heads with me as we ask God to bless our time together this morning. Uh, Father, thank you so much uh, just for the opportunity to sing. Even though we're scattered, even though we're not together as one body physically, we are together as one body spiritually, and that happened because of the death, burial, and resurrection of your son Jesus. And so, um, God, we are so thankful for that, and we pray that this morning as we sing, as we sit under the authority of your word, as we hear, uh, hear from you through your scriptures, Lord, that you would uh, just guide our hearts and strengthen our steps in the coming days, Lord, in, in a time of such unrest and turmoil um, within our community, within our, within our nation. Father, we, we know that you are good and that you are sovereign. You can be trusted. So, Lord, we just we commit ourselves to you. We commit our future to you. And we turn to you now, seeking your, your guidance and your wisdom and offering praise to you, which we pray and we hope um, is a pleasing aroma to your uh, to you. Father, um, be with us in this time as we, as we come to you with our souls open, our hearts open, our, our, our injuries, our hurts exposed, um, knowing that you are a good God who loves and shows mercy. So, Father, be with us in this time. Uh, even though we're far apart, help us to be one body in spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 121 says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade in your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him Yeah. 
source of all power and love. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise, refuge and strength to the end. Righteous Redeemer and mighty to save the Compassionate, merciful God, radiant, holy delight. Beautiful Father, victorious Son, source of unchangeable light. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise, refuge and strength to the end. Righteous Redeemer and mighty to save. Unwavering God, Shepherd who comes for the lost, Rock of salvation, remarkable love, Savior who died on the cross. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise, Refuge and strength to the end, Righteous Redeemer and mighty to save. Feel the world is broken. We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of
intend to dwell again with us. He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The lion of has made us a kingdom of priests to God to reign with the Son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of Thank you so much for your presence. Thank you for your love and for your songs that we get to sing back to you. God, I just pray that you would just come to everybody who's watching and let them know how much you love them. And God, I pray that we would let you know how much we love you too. God, be with Bob as he preaches this morning and just shares your love with your people and also just your disciplines and your statutes and your laws and everything. Help us to listen with open hearts and minds and change our lives according to your word. We love you and we're so grateful for all you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Uh, you know, again, looking around, I'm here, just the skeleton crew. At the moment, it is just uh, Mike and I, and he's back there handling the recording, and I'm up here handling the speaking because we flipped a coin, and that's how it worked out. Uh, but uh, <laughs> much to his relief, I think. Um, but anyway, on, on behalf of Pastor Roger, I personally, uh, the two of us, we want to thank you for your prayers and the grace that you've been uh, giving us as we lead through this challenging season of the pandemic. I keep looking around. I'm going to have to stop doing that. I know that there's nobody here. It's just force of habit. Uh, I, we we want to thank you for the grace that you've been showing us through the, throughout this season of the pandemic. It's been really hard. And um, we hope, like I said, like I said at the beginning, we hope to be back here in person live here at the church next Sunday, January 17th. But uh, we'll have to see how the next few days play out. But keep an eye on our Facebook page. So facebook.com slash new life QC um, and our new mobile app, uh, as those will be two easy places where we will be posting information and keeping you guys informed as to what's going on. Um, <clears throat> So shifting away from that, with everything that has taken place uh, in the last week, from the unrest uh, in Washington, D.C. and around the country, to the uptick in positive COVID cases and everything else that's going on, um, uh, this morning I want to offer you some encouragement. Uh, see, the world, the world around us is unsteady and, unsh and, and uh, very shaken, and, and right now the aftershocks of everything that's been going on are starting to be felt. The ripples are going out, and... Um, it's very unsettling, and in the midst of all of this shifting sand of the moment, my hope and my aim this morning uh, today is to offer you something solid, something upon which you can firmly plant your feet and trust that you will not fall. So if you would, if you have your Bibles handy, turn to Psalm 16, 
Uh, and if you don't have your Bible handy, pause the video and go get it, right? You know, I mean, it's one of the beauties of doing this not in real time is that if you forgot, oh, I forgot my Bible, I can, you know, you can press pause and you're not going to miss anything, which would be great. So uh, once you have your Bible, if you open it up to Psalm 16, please stand with me as I read from God's holy and inspired word. Psalm 16, a mictum of David. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion in my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Let's agree in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you this morning for your goodness, your grace, your mercy. The fact that, God, um, we know that none of this, none of what's gone on, in our country, in our world, has caught you off guard, that it's all within your knowledge, and God, you have purposes for these things, and so Father, we thank you, Um, we praise you for that, and we thank you that you've revealed yourself to us so that we can trust in in your purpose, and trust in what you're going to do, and and put our confidence in that, but Father, we also come with heavy hearts, confessing that we too often we don't trust enough. We don't trust in your provision. We have a, we have a tendency to, to look anywhere but to you in times of trouble. We have a habit of turning to worldly wisdom, to, to power structures that are here in this world when we're shaken rather than running to you. And so, Father, as we have heavy hearts, as we have burdens that are troubling us this morning, God, we need your help. We need your guidance. We need, we need your spirit to lead us to you. Father, convict our hearts by your spirit, comfort our hearts, steady our unsteadiness, and kindle a passion, a passion within us to to seek after you when the days are hard and difficult. Father, help us to do that because we know you alone are worthy, and you alone are able, and you alone have the power to heal our comfort and brokenness, or to heal our brokenness and turn it into comfort. Father, we ask this not for our sake or our pleasure, but for your glory and your kingdom's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's jump right in, shall we? We don't know a whole lot about the timeline for when this psalm was written, only that it is a psalm of David. And we know a lot. We know a lot about David, right? David is a man after God's own heart. David, who was the youngest son of Jesse, slayer of Goliath, the bane of Saul, friend of Jonathan, a musician, a dancer, a leader, a warrior, a king, an adulterer, a schemer of murder. Yet he was a man after God's own heart, and I have to stop, and I have to wonder what that means, because David really, he was a flawed man. He was uh, was a person who, when he was confronted with his flaws and his failures that that came about because of his flaws, he always turned back to God. He he sought the Lord's face. See, David wanted, wanted to be God's man through and through, even though his hands were far from from free of blood of his enemies, and, and he knew it. But David also knew that he wasn't anything special. Everything he had, he attributed to God. Unlike Saul, Saul in his arrogance believed that he was a big deal. David knew that everything that was his came because of God's hand and provision. In fact, in his final prayer in 
First Chronicles chapter 29, as he's praying over the offering that's going for the temple, he says, he says this, he says, but who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you and of your own we have given you. We are strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow and there is no abiding. O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. See, David doesn't lay any claim on any of what he's been given and what he's been blessed with and what the nation of Israel has been blessed with. He turns it back and says, God, all of this is yours. All of this is your provision. See, David knew who was in charge and his heart was settled on God's provision for him. So he was convinced in the moment that, that turning to God was the best move when things were unsettled. You see it throughout scripture. Whenever things are unsettled, he seeks the Lord's face. And this is no different. And I say all that to set the context of this, that we don't know what's going on, but we do know that David begins this psalm with a petition. He says, preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. Whatever is going on, it isn't good. Right? I mean, there's no need to look for refuge unless there is a problem. David knows that God is good, and that's why he turns to him. Look at how he phrases his relationship with the Almighty God. You are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. See, David sees the goodness of God and those who worship him in spirit and truth as he desires. Right? Like David sees that God is good, and he says, you are the only good thing about me. I have no good apart from you. And then he contrasts the, his relationship with God with the relationship of people who, who don't have a good relationship with God, right? He, he says, as for the saints in the land, they are excellent ones in whom is my delight. The saints in the land, the, the, those who are believers, those who, are, uh, who have put their faith in, in Jesus. Now the word saint, uh, in many ways, in the Old Testament, that we refer to them as saints, and that would be considered possibly Christians. They are lo- the God's set-aside, sanctified people in the Old Testament versus Christian, which is the, fra- the term we use for it in the New Testament. It's a whole other discussion for another time, and it's not perfect, but it's an example, right? So when he says, as for the saints in the land, these are the people who are following after God. These are the people who are doing it right. They are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. And then he contrasts that with the ones who aren't, right? The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply, shall multiply. Their, their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. David wants nothing to do with them. He recognizes that those who are following after another God have no blessing have no help, have no refuge from Almighty God. See, David keenly understands that there is a right way and a wrong way to follow God. And throughout his days, he has proven himself humble before God. When he has stumbled, when he has made missteps, when he has sinned, when he has done things that are not appropriate in in following after God, he turns, when confronted with them, he, he confesses them and turns himself over to God's judgment. He doesn't flaunt his kingship, even though he makes some big time errors. David recognizes that God is in control and going against that has dire consequences. And with the balance of our time together as we work through the rest of these 11 verses, I wanna focus on some of the provision that God makes for his people that are re- that's revealed by David's words in this psalm. And I hope to paint for you a picture of the breadth of God's love by looking at four provisions he makes for his people that God makes for his people. One, God provides a future. Two, God provides counsel. Three, God provides stability. And four, God provides joy. Let's work through these together. Firstly, God provides a future. Look at verses five and six. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. How great is that, right? Like, I mean, just think for a minute, right? To quote one commentator, David is essentially saying that nothing earthly, visible, or material is what satisfies me, but only Jehovah himself. It is the giver, not his gifts, that meets my wants. See, David looks at all that he has. He looks at all that he's received from the Lord's hand. And the best thing isn't the kingdom or the throne or the riches or the fame or the wealth or the honor or any of those things, but God himself. That's the greatest thing that he has received. And I love that for so many reasons, but it's something I think that we often here on this side of history, this side of Christ, take for granted. See, God 
offers himself to us. Jesus, who according to the author of Hebrews, is the radiance of, this, of his glory and the exact imprint of his nature, speaking of God, Jesus came to offer himself on our behalf to restore our relationship with the Father. He came to trade his righteousness for our sinfulness. And those who accept this gift receive what? Receive heaven? I mean, yes, that's a part of it, but more importantly, we receive the Holy Spirit who indwells us and seals us for the day when we take part in the marriage ceremony of the Lamb. Think that through for a minute. God The Son gives himself for us, for us, so that he can give himself to us at the end of all things, so that we can be his people and he can be our king. See, we get so caught up in talking about the guarantee of an eternity spent with God, right? We, can, we, we consider heaven, the things above, how amazing it will be. And, and that's true. It will be so much more unimaginably better than anything we can think of in the here and now. It's a beautiful place with no tears or pain or death. But the best part of it is not the fact that there's no tears or pain or death or its beauty, but that we get to spend it an eternity with God himself. Understand that there are earthly blessings for trusting God, for following Jesus in the here and now, but what God promise us, promises us has little to do with earthly things, right? We know. Jesus says in John chapter 16, 17, he says in this, or in uh, chapter 16, he says, Uh, In this world, you will have tribulation. You will have struggle. That's a promise. It's not, the earthly promise is not for good things to happen to you here. The future that's promised for you when you give yourself to God fully and totally and completely and submit yourself to his will for you is that you get him. You get to spend eternity with God. So as we muddle through our lives here and during this fallen and brokenness that we deal with day in and day out and struggle against, we look to God with hopeful eyes for the future that he provides. And that future is God himself. Secondly, God provides counsel. See, David recognizes his need for counsel. Verse 7, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night he... In the night also my heart instructs me. And again in verse 11, he says, you make known to me the path of life. See, the king, the king knows his own inadequacies, his own shortcomings, his own need for help and guidance. David knows that he needs instruction and he knows where to find it. He goes to God. But throughout the Psalms, it's a, it's a common theme. David writes about the Lord's instruction over and over and over again, beginning with the very first two verses of the very first psalm. Blessed are those who walk not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. And then again in Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Psalm 119, the largest chapter in the Bible, 170 some odd verses, right, is a prayer about delighting in the very word of God. It is a love letter to God about how instructive his word is to those who would follow it. Look, I know that you know this, or at least I hope that you do, that the Bible is God's progressive revelation of himself to mankind, that it's not, it's, not pra- it's not just a book of practical applications, although the Bible is intensely realistic and intensely practical. It's not basic instructions before leaving earth, B-I-B-L-E, right? Um, it is God revealing himself to us in a way that we can understand so that we can respond appropriately, so that we can know him and return to him. And while the Bible doesn't give us specific instruction about every issue, the word is alive and impactful. 
It leads us to a deeper understanding of ourselves, of our condition, of our sinfulness, of our need for a Savior. It holds up for us the standard by which we should be living, a standard which we cannot possibly meet. And if that's how we look to God for counsel, we would be crushed for certain. If we look to God for counsel to say, God, tell me what it is I'm supposed to do, and we looked at it and we said, that is hard. I can't do that. We would be like the rich young ruler when when he approaches Jesus and Jesus says, you know, here's what you must do. You must sell all of your your possessions and give to the poor. And the rich young ruler walks away discouraged and disheartened because it's way more than we can possibly imagine. But God's counsel isn't for us to be crushed. God's counsel isn't for us to be crushed, it's to be redeemed. It's to heed his warnings, to repent. His his counsel to us is to seek Jesus, to give ourselves to him completely. See, God's word provides a solution to every dilemma, every problem, every worldly hardship we might face, and that solution is Jesus. And I know that may sound trite that y'all need Jesus, but that's the truth. Because I need Jesus. Every single person who's living and breathing and walking on this earth right now needs Jesus. That is the counsel that God gives us. As great as it is to have wisdom and think through these things, because those are all good things, the best thing is Jesus. Does the Bible advise us how to live out our faith in practical ways? Absolutely, it does. But the counsel of God, the wisdom, the instruction that we find really points us to the fact that we are great sinners. But God sent a greater Savior. Seeking the Lord's face humbly, we find life when we turn to Him him for counsel, for the answer to our sinfulness. Thirdly, God provides stability. David remembers the stability. He stands firm in it, but it's not in his own strength or own wisdom or own might that he stands. Verse 8, he says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is my right hand. I shall not be shaken. See, the promise of God to never leave or forsake his people, a promise made by God but emphasized by Moses as the Israelites were getting ready to enter the promised land in Deuteronomy chapter 31, and that should be a place of strength. It's the same promise. It's the same advice that, uh, that, that David passes along to Solomon at the end of his life. In First Chronicles chapter 28 verse 20, David tells his son, he says, be strong and courageous and do it. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed for the Lord God, even my God, is with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. In Psalm 27, David declares, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? See, Jesus described the stability that God brings at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, using a metaphor of two builders at the end. You perhaps remember the picture. Jesus likens those to uh, two builders, one who builds on sand and one who builds on rock and solid rock. Likens those who build their life upon his words and teaching like those who build on that foundation of stone. And the one who builds on the rock when the storm of life comes and the waves crash and everything else, the, the building isn't moved, it's stable, it's secure because it's built on the rock. But the one who builds on sand, who builds on the soft, who builds on anything other than Christ, when the storms come, the the house collapses in on itself. And it says, and great was the ruin. Here's the conversation. Here's the conversation of stability that Scripture has within you when you come looking for solid ground. You begin, you come with your sin. You say, Am I a sinner? The answer is yes. Does God love me? Scripture responds with yes. How much does he love me? He loves you enough to send Jesus to die for you while you were dead in your sins. And you respond, but what happens next? And Scripture says you accept the free gift. And you respond, and then what? And Scripture says you try to do your best to follow God's will. And then we pause because we're like, but what about when I fail? And scripture says it's forgiven. 
what? You heard me. It's forgiven. My future sins are forgiven too? The ones I haven't even committed yet? Yes. What's the catch? There is no catch. You have been greatly forgiven by a great love from a great God. See, here's the deal. You are a sinner by nature and by choice, but when God intervenes and rescues you from your sin, it's from all of your sin. You still have to deal with sin's power over you. You still have to submit yourself and your actions and your freedom to God's will for you, but you are no longer under the penalty of sin. There is no shaky ground beneath your feet anymore. You don't have to worry that the next tremor that comes is going to trip you up because God has already healed the bruises that you're going to get when you fall. What is there to be unsure about? Our God is unchangeable. He is the same yesterday and today and tomorrow, and his love for you does not wax or wane like the moon. You are standing on the solid rock. All other ground is sinking sand. The stability that God provides is is there when we begin to put him before us and he is, for, he is foremost in our mind because we can trust that even when we stumble that we are forgiven. Lastly, God provides joy. Listen to David's heart. Not just his words, but the emotion behind them. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The future, this future that God provides, this counsel, this stability which God provides produces in David joy. David's heart is glad and his whole being rejoices in God's presence is the fullness of joy and it's a result of being in a right relationship with God. See, God produces that in us. It's part of the fruit of the Spirit, right? It's not a coconut, but love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians 5, and 23. See, it's something from outside of ourselves which is produced in us by God. And David can rejoice knowing that his needs are met by God, that his provider, Jehovah Jireh, is caring for him. I love it. In Luke 10, in Luke 10, when the 72 return to Jesus to testify about what God's been doing, Jesus responds that his authority has been given to them, but what was really important wasn't what God was doing through them, but what he had wrought in them. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Which I'm sure would have been a little bit of a strange thing to hear if you're the disciples, right? I mean, they're all hyped up on these miracles. They're like, whoa, this is awesome. Listen, listen to all this great stuff that God's been doing. Listen to this. It's been fantastic. But it goes back to understanding the inheritance that David talked about earlier. It's not about the earthly thing, but the heavenly thing. As much as David's needs were met here on earth, David was rejoicing in in knowing that his spiritual need would be met too. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. You know the path of, or you make known the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of your uh, fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. See, David's not in that moment. In that moment, that difficult, that hardship. Remember, he's seeking refuge. Whatever is going on around him is not good, it's not positive, it's challenging, it's hard. David's not experiencing that joy in the moment, but he does look forward to experiencing it later. He's singing the unending song of unending joy, of an unending eternity, spent with a marvelous and glorious Savior. As we As we struggle with things in this life, it is easy to get distracted from what is set before us. Our focus needs to be, as the author of Hebrews writes, to lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. 
looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. See, Jesus' joy is that sinners are going to repent, that sinners are going to return to God, right? There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. God's joy over our salvation is our joy of an eternity spent with Him. So as we consider the hard, difficult, challenging days that lay ahead, as we continue to work through the pandemic, as our country continues to heal and, and, and mourn and grieve the things that have gone on from, from senseless murders to racial injustice to social injustice to all of the things that are happening around our country and around our world which grieve us, God says, let me be your refuge. Let me be your provision. Let me provide for your future. Let me provide counsel. Let me provide stability. Let me provide joy. As we close, I just want to encourage you, encourage you to seek the Lord wherever you are, whatever it is you're going through, whatever situations are weighing you down because everybody's got situations that are weighing them down, whether it be from a family member who's sick, a family member who doesn't know God, a a struggle at work, a struggle at home, a struggle with children, physical maladies and illness, depression, economic hardship, whatever it is, know that God is there for you. He wants to be your refuge. He wants you to seek comfort in Him. Let this psalm be a prayer that you recite to yourself, that you read to yourself, that that let David's words be yours. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrow of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion in my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day, this time, and your word, and the truth that we find in it, the challenging um, counsel that tells us that we are in need of repentance, the future that is promised, the future of you, uh, an inheritance that is you. Lord, the stability that we find in trusting that God, that one that you have provided and that you're going to provide, uh, but Lord, also that we know that our sins are forgiven when we confess them to you, when we turn to you, when we accept the grace that you've poured out upon us. Lord, what joy is to be found when we give ourselves fully and totally to you. So Lord, would you help us? Would you help us to cut through all of the nonsense that we see? Would you help us to remain focused? We invite you into our hearts and into our lives and into our minds. Transform us and renew us. 
by the power of your spirit so that we may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Lord, we need your help. We lay our lives at your feet and we just ask that you would guide us to truth and help us to remember that you are a great refuge. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.